Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Demartini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on today. We're going to be talking with Bibi uh, Baharami. And what we're going to be talking about is we're going to talk about the way of the wild goose. We're going to be getting to experience the journey uh, that, you know, she has taken. You know, when we talk about three pil- pilgrimages, I love this. I just love this. I love the book and I love that we get to talk about it. Because what happens when you decide you're going to be following geese, stars, and hunches? What happens when you do that? Uh, uh, what happens when you do it and you decide to go in the Camino de Santiago? And what happens when you look at your life and you take a look at what that means? What happens when you bump right up against an adventure, a pursuit? Maybe there's mysteries that you didn't anticipate. But what is it about you that has to be prepared for it? And what is it about this journey that changes you? Before we get into it, and I tell you a little bit more about my very special guest, I want to say hello to Micah and hello to Benny. Hi, Micah and Benny. Another day in the life of, right? (laughs) Many of you ask me, how many producers do we have? Well, we have as many as we need. You know, of course, you've heard Micah, you've heard Jacob, you've heard Benny. Some of you work with Lydia. And then, of course, there's Jessica. And every once in a while, you'll see me get behind the (laughs) mixing board. But that is really not my strong suit. But all of it is about a journey. And when I think about Bibi, when I think about my guest, and I think about who she is, Dr. Bibi, when I think about award-winning traveler, anthropologist, uh, she's going to help me explain to my best friend, Linda, why I'm so struck by the History Channel. So many people, they tune into other things, they watch other things. <laughs> but when you come to my television and you turn it on, why is the History Channel on? Because I think at some point in my life, I'm a closeted adventurer and now I adventure in the digital way. But if you are, if you're Dr. Beebe, this is what you are. You travel. You're so fascinated. You have gone to places. You have seen things. But then you have gotten to take the adventure of what I call understanding. See, it's one thing to go see. But it's another thing to take the adventure of understanding. See, that is the core for me. If all of us were to take the adventure of understanding, it doesn't matter what political realm you're in, this would be a very Mm -hmm. different place. And when you take that, you will be amazed and shocked at what you discover. Because what seems like a carving in stone is actually a story, maybe even a message. If you're wondering why the country of Chile is so amazingly, amazingly, as my friend would say, supernatural, I don't call it that. But why is it in this one country, why is there the adventure of more sightings, more glyphs, more carvings, more amazing things that ancient people have done? And if you understand that question of why, then you'll understand my very special guest today, her fantastic book, The Way of the Goose, and why the why without judgment is so important to understanding. Dr. Beebe, it's great to have you. Welcome to the show. Dr. Pat, it's so great being here. Thank you. I I was reading your book and I was just looking at just a glimpse of your life. Let's just call it a glimpse for a moment because <laughs> there's no way I can understand it. 
And I, I think before the show, I was telling you how I was reminded of um, Olivia Newton-John. I consider her my friend. And I was reminded of when she decided to take that journey. And, and we did several shows with her to follow her on that journey. But for people that are listening, from your perspective, this idea of journeying to understand, it seems like it's been a part of you since as far as I could read about you, how did you come to be in that way? What a great question. I think I've always realized that if you get boots on the ground, you learn a whole lot more than if you just stay at home and, and read about it. And that's also a good thing to do. <laughs> but uh, I've always just um, been curious about what's over the next hill and what might that teach me about where I am. And I also think when I really got into um, my interest in spiritual traditions and meditation, I realized I'm not a sitting still meditator. I need to go for a walk. And as I walk, not only am I learning about the world out there, but I'm casting the road within and I'm learning about what's going on inside and the two connect. So I've always just been really curious. And then I discovered what a powerful tool to learn about so, uh, what you're going to learn until you go over the next hill and you, you get out of your comfort. Yeah. I, I mean, so, let me do that. Yeah. I mean, this home. is, yeah, and this is really looking. what I love about this because, you know, as we're talking about this, I love that the energetic, you know, wavelengths start to tap into, because here's what I know after doing this for 20 years. Um, you know, what I know about this is that in the world we live in and how we live into it, um, when we say yes to something, right, mm -hmm. something else changes and it creates a ripple effect. Absolutely. And I think that's what you're talking about. And I believe that's in your book in so many different ways in so many different places, right? Yes. I mean, people say, what, why do you keep going back on walking the Camino? What's so special about the Camino? And the Camino is saying yes to something that you don't really quite understand. You just feel called to go and explore. And all these synchronicities start showing up. Yeah. I think, yeah, Benny, um, Micah, why don't we take a short break if we could? And when we come back, let's see what we can do here because I think we've got a lot of energy. I think it's because of the yeah. yes. Yeah. Let's just take a quick break if we could, Benny and Micah. And when we come back, more with this amazing journey and adventure. Everybody, welcome. It's so great, again, to be connecting with all of you. I got to tell you, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't tell you. I, I think I'm going to have my guest talk about things um, to you because I have been asked and I, and I am being asked more often than not about how I got here, right? Um, you know, and I, I, I learned that through reading your book, Dr. Beebe, I, I learned that, that by reading your book, there may not be a logical answer, for, answer for, to people to tell them how I got here. Because on paper, it doesn't seem logical. But when I take a look at, uh, correct me if I just, when I look at the watercolor and the pen and ink, because I'm a visual, right? Right. Of course, right. I'm reading your book. Well, when I'm looking at this, I am thinking if I could create the story to answer that question of how I got here to people, I would call on you to help me do it. <laughs> I would, I'd be like, please help me. Because I don't know how you came to understand the journey the way you have. Because not just this book, but your body of work, your life, pay mm -hmm. so much respect and homage. You know, you 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 just honor these journey, these places, as if you were part of the land, as if you were part of the wind. And that's why I asked you the question earlier about, you know, how did you come to be, to be you? 
But it's interesting if we look at the goose as a totem, mm. as medicine, just a moment. Let's just mm -hmm. take a moment to just honor, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the only endeavor you had. And when I stepped back and I looked at the goose, the pigeon, the boar, the rabbit. Oh, I could talk about rabbit till I'm green. <laughs> and you put it all together. And the way that you wrote the book mm. and how you keep us engaged, mm. it shows me just an acute honoring of the elements of the four-legged, of the two-legged, of the crawling, of all of that. In your words, how did this, how did the pilgrimage, how did they change you? Mm. And can you recall moments along the way where you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Um, the pilgrimage changed me most profoundly by just inviting me to simplify everything, carry what I needed on my back. Great. And it, it's amazing how little you need to, to you know, live everyday life. Uh, so a few clothes, bottle of water, a bit of food, and and not just simplifying and and saying this is all I need, but um, simplifying in the sense of dropping a lot of fear about what if you know what if I this happens, do I have enough for this? Instead of shifting that and saying let me just trust, this is a path that is going to support me and trusting. So I really, by walking the Camino de Santiago, I learned not only do I need very little. But I also found that every single day, all my needs were met and sometimes more than my needs. You know, it was just even the hard days, there were great gifts at the end of it. And I, everything that I needed came to me. And that living like that for 40, 44 days on end rewires you and you go home and you realize, first of all, I don't need a lot of stuff. Second of all, I should trust life more. If I trust life more, I'll start seeing avenues that I didn't see that are open and inviting me to walk down them. It also changed me. I mean, all my life I've loved nature and I felt a connection to nature and I'm very lucky. I was born in, in Colorado and I grew up in the mountains. So I was able to have that immediate access to wild, raw nature. But the Camino taught me more than any other experience in my life to be present and to listen and that everything around us is actually speaking. Mm -hmm. And it's something that my, my, my friend Bernadette, the 89 year old friend in Sarlat in Southwestern France, she, she was, I was embarking on this journey of following the goose. Uh, she said, you really need to read more about the language of the birds. And I thought, well, it's poetic and mystical, <laughs> but what does that mean? You know? And then I started discovering what it means is the language of nature and it's a language that human beings have spoken and understood for a long, long time, but we started losing our ability to speak it the more and more we separated ourselves from nature. And I would say the last 500 years were the grand slam of that yeah. <laughs> real separation. Um, so, but it, it, it taught me the language of the birds again and how to listen to nature and listen to the stories that, that, everything around us has to tell us not just other people yeah and that's what i love and wanted you to share about this because it is the it is the journey that you go on and i love the advice to listen to the birds i mean it's mm -hmm. fascinating when we think about that you know mm -hmm. we think about what that really means and sometimes we we just cannot listen because our own minds are too busy there's too much of a tailspin there's too much you know noise in the in the channel there's a deja vu in the matrix whatever you want to call it right and and for me i'm like you i had to step away from my day to day you know and my journey my first journey started in 1997 it's not that i didn't journey before that because i had what's the word i'm looking for I had glimpses of what it would be like, mm -hmm. right? But not quite the way you describe in the book and not quite the beauty of what you describe in the book and the languages of this. Because let me ask you this question. 
we can refer to birds, but there is a uniqueness. There is a uniqueness when you look at a red cardinal or a cardinal, mm -hmm. or you look at a duck, right? Mm -hmm. There is a uniqueness in each. And do you find that each has its own, um, its own very unique, special understanding we can gain? Absolutely. I mean, I think we all intuitively know when we've watched a red cardinal, what it can teach us. And it's very different from what a duck can teach us. <laughs> or a titmouse or, you know, uh, a sparrow. Uh, definitely, definitely. And they, and they all have their wisdom and their serious side, but they also have their sense of humor and they teach us to lighten up a bit. You know, why are you taking this so seriously? Really? You know, just be present. <laughs> it really is true. I mean, I grew up in New York and I got to tell you, you know, it's fascinating because uh, anybody that knows anything about New York will understand that you pretty much will be visited, especially like in Manhattan and some of the pigeon. Right. <laughs> you are going to make friends with the pigeon, whether you want yeah. to or not. And I remember as a kid, you know, how fascinated I was. And I'll tell you what the hardest thing was for me growing up. And I never quite understood this till later on in life. This idea of don't feed the pigeons. And I never quite as a kid, you just logically it doesn't make sense. Right. right? Especially if you're drawn. And then when you get older, you kind of have a sense of it. But you talk about the pigeon as well. Ah, on the Camino. Are you are you thinking about pigeon hunting season, perhaps? Oh, my gosh. I can't even think about it. It's like sad. It's like crazy. Yeah, that was definitely one of the first ordeals that, that met me on the first pilgrimage recounted in the book. Um, yep. Yeah, we were walking during pigeon hunting season in the remote forested areas of the Pyrenees on a less popular route in France, going the other direction on top of that. And uh, the innkeeper the first night in Saint-Jean-Pierre-de-Port, um, when he learned we were walking in that direction, he said, by the way, it's pigeon hunting season. It's come early. And I was thinking, what is pigeon hunting season? I had no idea. Absolutely, absolutely naive to the ancient traditions of the Pyrenees and it being October. And it turns out that, um, indeed, pigeon hunting season altered the entire cadence of that whole three-week pilgrimage. For one thing, it shut down the inns and the restaurants and cafes in these remote areas because everyone was pigeon hunting. And for another, it set us up um, in competition in the forests with the pigeon hunters who wanted everyone to be very, very quiet for this yes. bird. <laughs> so, but then there was the boar hunter. And there was, was were the rabbit hunters yep. also in this it, so many so many wonderful ordeals to deal with and comedy a lot of comedy in hindsight <laughs> <laughs> that's why you and I are laughing I mean for those of you tuning in you're gonna have to read the book to really get a to sense read. of it yeah. uh, but there is comedy when we meet nature if we can see it you know look yes. I, the reason i i ask you about the pigeon is because i i i spent a, a short period of time although in my life it was really pivotal as being homeless in new york city and mm -hmm. you know people often often wonder about that and one of the things mm -hmm. that you the hardest to see, okay true i've never shared this on air benny never I always talk about the fact that I talk about dumpster diving, right? For food and hot dogs, right? Mm -hmm. But I never talk about this one thing because it was hard for me. If you grow up loving pigeons and then you're watching people that you're with in a situation, look at that pigeon as food is really hard to get past. I mean, honestly, for me, right? I was better at begging for money at the Port Authority, so I would not have to resort to the pigeon, right? But I'm <laughs> laughing a little bit about it now. I mean, I can laugh a little bit about it now when you're in that situation, not so much. But even when you look at that and to find out that everything in the earth provides us with what we need, Yes. Now, there are some of people that I hung out with back then that thought I was nuts 
diving in dumpsters, yeah. right? The alternative for them was pigeon stew. I'm just saying, you all. <laughs> but that was an early lesson in my life. Mm -hmm. It really helped me discover part of myself. Mm -hmm. Like, what is not negotiable for Pat? Right? Right. And then you have to step back and laugh about it. Because while I'm digging for really somebody else's hot dog that they've half eaten, they're having a pigeon feast over there <laughs> under the overpass. <laughs> and I love the way life brings us full circle. But mm -hmm. boy, you've had so many adventures. Yes, nothing like what you just recounted. Oh, that's I, mean, just, that's... I never shared that on air because <laughs> I just remembered it chapter. as I was reading your book. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just came up. Yeah. Um, but there are so many adventures and there are so many lessons and there's so much understanding. I want to take a short break, Benny. When we come back, I want to talk about some of the other journeys. You and I have had experiences with some of the other beautiful things of nature. One of the toughest experiences I've had was making peace with both a serpent and a fuzzy bee at the same time. Mm. Are you all ready to make peace with what is in your life um how do people get a copy of the book and please how do they find out more about you yeah. can we get them to your website absolutely um they can find out all of this in how to get my book on my website and they can just google either the title of the book or my name and it will appear it's for sale everywhere it's yeah. on bookshop.org it's in your local independent bookstore it's on all the online venues. It's You can get it from Monkfish Book Publishing as well, directly from the publisher. Yep. And I just want to tell everybody, if you're wondering what this is, let me just say it again. It's the way of the goose, the way of the wild goose, three mm -hmm. pilgrim pilgrimage. This is the three pilgrimages following geese, stars, and hunches. When we come back, we're going to talk about the hunches, right? <laughs> Why do some hunches feel like punches? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about. Why, what, what happens when you when the hunches, you really think you should follow, feel like punches? What is the mm -hmm. message? What is the understanding? Dr. Beebe and I will talk about that. Benny, Micah, let's take a short break. We'll be right back. Everybody, welcome back. Welcome back to the Dr. Pat Show. It's so great to have all of you tune us in, turn us on. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I am so thrilled. We're talking about the way of the wild goose. These are three pilgrimages, but I must say there's so much more here. First of all, it's a beautifully written book. But the other part of this that's so wonderful when you look at it is the sensory aspect of the of what you will feel and how you will see things through the eyes of Dr. Beebe. It's really just interesting mm -hmm. when you open up the pages and you feel like, wait a minute, a magical trail. It continued. How did it continue? Are we going on a forbidden pathway? Or what is it about the goose? Do they fly together? What do you learn from them? And then, of course, if you're traveling across this incredible terrain, you know, whether it, you've never been there before or you know that the Romans have named it goose territory, right? Who knew yeah. they did that, <laughs> right? But then what is the meaning of it? Is it trusting in the benevolence of the universe? Is it trusting in the magic of that? Is it shifting away, I think, as you, Dr. Beebe, say in the book, shifting away from fear thinking to trust thinking? Mm -hmm. Because that one part of the book alone is really the goal for many people today. So thank you for doing this and thank you for writing it. But this really leads me to this, you know, I mean, I know you know what I mean when you say hunches with punches, right? You know, mm -hmm. right? You get a sense of what I'm alluding to with that. That is about trust. Absolutely. I mean, everyone, we all get hunches. We, we all get that sense of when it might, it might be something that just hits us from the side and we weren't even expecting it or we, we, we're, we're just daydreaming or thinking about something and something very true and honest 
hits our solar plexus and and we just kind of go i that that feels good that feels important i need to explore that and um but a lot of times you know those hunches also are asking us to change something you know they 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 are demanding a, that pound of flesh in a way to, to follow it because a hunch might be a big hunch for me was I really was not, uh, I, I had worked in all kinds of different contexts, you know, from university professor to magazine editor to ethnographic consultant. And I really benefited and, and loved all of those walks of life, but they never fully felt like this is what I should be doing for the rest of my life. And the hunch was, you've always wanted to be a writer, you love writing, you need to go with writing. And there's not a job description that's comfortable in our society for, you know, hanging your shingle out and saying writer. <laughs> you know? no. And so it was, you know, it, 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 you really have to take some chances with those hunches, those deep, big hunches uh, that are saying, you, you're going to need to change your life. You're going to need to quit your job. You're going to need to wake up every morning at 530 and write you know, and, and go in this direction. And I have no regrets that I followed that hunch because it was, it was really leading me to my best and true path. Um, but it was really hard. It was really hard. And I learned well on the Camino that if you trust your hunches, even if it sends you through an ordeal and a challenge, it is always going to give you a gift at the end of that. And usually the gift is far better than anything you could have imagined. And I think it was actually the Camino that gave me the courage by having these little hunches that would keep, you know, every day the, the, the ordeals, but then the gifts would come. And I thought, well, if this happens consistently on the Camino, it should happen in life too. If we actually fully trust something that our, our real truth, inner truth is telling us is the right direction to go no matter whether it makes sense or not to ourselves or even more so the, the world around us. Yeah. And, you know, this is why I love talking with you. And this is why the understanding in the book is so important because what you and I were talking about during the break, I want to just really explain to people, you know, you and I are human beings, right? We have right. enormous capacity for so much, including doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and obtuseness and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes the revelations come from unknown places they come from from the strangest things now yeah. not everybody listening to this is is going to be able to book a, a flight and go on an adventure but the point i want to make to everybody we can create these adventures because yes. you don't necessarily have to travel afar to do them right? Mm -mm. Especially if you live in the state that I live in, Washington State, to be honest with you, you, you can don't get have in to a leave car. home. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, you can get in a car yeah. and you can drive a half hour and to be a place where you will see things and be open to hearing things that you've not imagined, right? Right. But it is that willingness and wantingness to really understand something that is invisible to the eye, perhaps, and that can transform you. I want to talk about the serpent or the snake for a minute. Mm. Um, you know, growing up in New York, you know, you don't have a lot of snake activity going out there. But I also lived in New Jersey. And <laughs> my fascination for rattlesnakes and snakes, especially the, the when you see them serpents in Egyptian glyphs and paintings it's i've always been fascinated i've been fascinated by these medicines that i've never even been confronted with some of mm. them but i did get confronted with the snake mm. and why would that happen and this is what i want to talk about uh, in your book and this journey you see i didn't know that sitting on a rock ledge in the high desert in the sun I didn't understand that rattlesnakes like to do that too, <laughs> sunbathing. And when you decide you're going to find this place and sit there and you mm. don't know that, your entire set of ego and fear will show up. 
to the point where you're having a conversation with the snake and you're just so ignorant, unlike what your mentor told you about snakes, and you refuse to move and you think you are going to have it out with this snake on this ledge. What part of us gets to understand and learn? And I will tell you this. I'm not going to talk any more about it, but I will tell you by the end of three days, the conversations I had with this beautiful creature, right? Mm. We got to share the ledge. Yeah. But I had to surrender so much. What did you learn on your journey? Well, I'll, I'll back up a bit because, you know, what does the snake have to do with the Camino, with the yes. goose? Yes, and, do it. You know, why are you bringing it up? Because it clearly is in the book. <laughs> it is in the book. Yeah. And that was one of the surprises for me because once I started following the signs of the goose, which is the goose throughout human history and all the way back into prehistory, this is one of the most depicted animals in human art from the beginning except for one other animal, and that is the snake. And I kept coming, encountering the snake as I was following the goose. And, um, and also even in, in more recent art forms that are uh, associating the Camino with the goose, there's this, this game called the Game of the Goose that is a popular children's game in Europe. It rose out of the Middle Ages, probably has earlier precursors in ancient Greece and in ancient Egypt, but we know it as the game of the goose from around the 1500s. And it's in the form of a, of a coiling serpent. And on the, it's, it's this board game that looks like a coiling serpent, like snakes and ladders, if you can imagine. And it has 13 geese throughout these 63 squares that are on the, this coiling spiral shaped board game. And anytime a goose appears on a square, it's a good luck piece. But I just, I, so here you have the goose and the snake form. That's just a one example, but it keeps appearing in medieval Romanesque art on the medieval churches of the Camino. There are a lot of depictions of women with snakes and they're called femme au serpent. And that iconography also connected to the symbolism of the goose as this older pre-Christian uh, animal associated with the native European goddess or goddesses. So is the snake. And oftentimes the same goddess had the goose as her animal and also had the snake as her animal. And that same goddess wound up being the great mother goddess, the great mother earth in many names, Artemis, Patnia yeah. Theron, La Reine Pédoc, the mistress of animals, all of these. So I, but in, of all her creatures, the waterfowl, especially the goose and the snake. And I started finding the snake associated with her as the most primal expression of her creation. It, she, she, there was one Romanesque sculpture that I saw from the 12th century, um, now preserved in a museum in Toulouse, of the mother earth giving birth to a snake. And you see it coming out of her vulva and going and breastfeeding on her left breast. And the art historians said, you know, it was misinterpreted as the fall from the Garden of Evil, Eden and, and, and sin and Eve's great, you know, uh, error and all this, but that's all wrong. It actually is an older iconography going back to pre-Christian uh, associations of this is the way the mother earth was shown, giving birth to creation. And the serpent is shown most commonly in this relationship because it is the most uh, primal form of life. I mean, we are all essentially a mouth, a middle, and an end, you know, <laughs> you know, it's the basic model. So, but no other creature than the snake caresses the earth with its entire body. So yeah. there's something very special about this creature. And I started realizing I need to learn a lot more about snakes to understand this yeah. whole association of, 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 of spiritual initiatory paths and ancient iconography and how it represents creation and that create creation was really given to the creator was associated with a feminine form. So it's also the lost feminine divine that these two creatures are hinting at and, and, and preserving and carrying forward, even in contexts where the feminine divine is now put into a secondary position compared to the masculine divine. Yes. And, uh, and I, I found a wonderful uh, New Testament scholar 
at the Princeton uh, Theological Seminary, um, Charles, Charlesworth, James Charlesworth, who wrote a whole book about the good and evil serpent. And he said, he also scratched his head, why has this serpent become associated yeah. with so much uh, negativity when in all ancient societies, including biblical societies, it was actually a positive force. Um, yeah. And more, it was, it and, was revered. I mean, that that's why I yeah. asked you about it is because yeah. there's a healing energy of the snake and the serpent. And I want yes. to ask you about that on your journey. Yeah. I mean, it is many things. But the one thing I know for sure is that it is one of the transformation totems. I, totem is a strange mm -hmm. word, but I'll use it. Um, it is one of those. Um, but it also represents healing. It represents life changes. Yes. And I would have been shocked if there wasn't one in your book. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because isn't it, when you take on a pilgrim, pilgrimage like this, yeah. it would be the one thing that I would expect to show up, except if you're in Hawaii. Because they don't have yes. any there. Okay. So yes. we wouldn't expect it in Hawaii. Yeah. But I guarantee you, you'll get a bunch of other stuff, things in Hawaii. Yeah. What did well, you anyway, learn from it? Yeah, you know, I I learned for one thing. I I write more about this the the sculptures, the medieval yes, sculptures depicting serpents. But I yeah. have had a number of of snake encounters on the Camino and hiking in southwestern France. Yep, and a couple of times with a viper. Um, so, and anytime you come into such close contact, immediate contact with a snake, everyone knows who's been there you get a very different visceral feeling in your body compared to any other animal you've come in touch with. And I think that's one reason why they capture our imagination and we put them in that special position. Even the Old Testament puts the serpent as this very special creation that God was especially pleased with. You know, he, that's why the serpent is in charge of the, the tree of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a very special creature, but um, the... It, it, its positive associations are as as regenerative, yeah. resurrection, um, fertility, yeah. and and these are also associations that the goose has. These two creatures, they migrate. They, I mean, they one migrates, one goes into hibernation, so they disappear seasonally, and then they reappear. And one molts feathers, one sheds skin. They both lay eggs, which is a very external show of fertility. Whereas we humans hide our fertility until we really show. You know, but from the very beginning, they're putting it out there. Got an egg, <laughs> you know, and uh, they're and they, and they're also masters of of the underground, you know, waterways and and the subterranean world, but also of the the the, the middle earth and of the yeah. sky. They can they can transcend. They can move through water, air, stone. Uh, and yeah. the sky. So there, there, there's a bit of a shamanic association. They're in the three realms, the lower, middle, yeah. and upper. Uh, so there's a lot of things. And I think when you encounter a snake, especially, you feel that, that power of this creature that is so different from you, but also has so many universal traits. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and that's why I'm scratching the surface. It because it really talks to. Um, the many different aspects of your book and your journey and what people will experience along the way. You see, they will get to be part of that. Now, you know, look, whether you confront one head on or you relate to a glyph or you relate to a stone etching or you relate to something, right? I mean, because my first encounter with a snake wasn't real in, in person. It was through the imagery, right? Mm -hmm. It was through the diagrams, it was through the watercolors, it was through those kinds of things. And there's so much in your in in your journey that is so fascinating to look at. You know, there, yeah. Th there are there are people who are locals living on the Camino, serving the Camino, and they talk about the pilgrimage road across northern Spain as a serpentine road as and they talk about it having kundalini energy exactly they talk about it connecting to your energy when you put your feet onto it and exactly. this ley line energy so it's you know it, at that level as well mm -hmm. it, it, it comes into play i want to ask you this in the time we have left and i know we have about you know five or six minutes left 
there is a special message in the book and everyone will get to take away their own message because that's where you wrote the book. Mm -hmm. But I have to ask you, as you sit here today now, after the fact, how would you describe the book's message for the world? It's a two-layered message. The first is, you know, when I first started following the goose, I was following arrows on the Camino. And at some point, I realized that the arrows are directing us for everything on the surface, which is important. You need to navigate. You need to find your way. But if you invert the arrow, it becomes a goose footprint. And it's mm. saying, look below the surface. Look for things that are not immediately evident. Listen to them. Pay attention. Open your vision more widely and deeply to see what's really going on. That's the first. And the second is... All this iconography and the survival, of, of why, why the goose again? I mean, this goose is also related to Mother Goose. This goose is related to ancient goddesses from native Europe and Asia. And uh, why is it surviving in a medieval root and then in the Christian tradition? And, and the answer is that, you know, the, the more and more the Christian tradition became a patriarchal tradition and there was less voice for the feminine the more these old voices mm -hmm. found another way to survive. I mean, M Mother Mary also has taken on, she's, her shrines on the Camino are on pre-Christian sites that venerated the native goddesses who were also associated with waterways, geese, mm -hmm. snakes, and other, other natural uh, beings. And that's where her shrines are. And so it's 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 like the goose is, is the, the, the lost feminine divine that is mm -hmm. held on. And Mother Goose is one of those vestiges of she keeps telling us her stories in a safe way where she won't get silenced. And the really deep message is we need to return to that balance where all voices count, because yeah. if they don't, none of us is whole. We're all lopsided. We're all leaning towards, you know, <laughs> one version. Um, and. And that's what I really learned is it's the Mother Earth saying, reconnect with me. You, you've severed yourself. You're, you're now, you're not even connected to this, this very planet that still sustains and feeds you, but you don't even realize it. And that is the lost feminine divine in, in the Western tradition. Uh, so that's the deeper message. Let's reconnect with the Earth, reveal, revere her, live in balance with her and take care of her mm -hmm. and each other. You know, it's so interesting you bring this up because everybody that listens to me knows that I have been a Greta Thunberg fan forever since oh, even like that Greta was like born and popped out and like, I don't even remember how old she was. Um, and sometimes we mistake the divine feminine for being soft and gentle and being that thing that is so vulnerable and weak at times, but the divine feminine is not, you know, the divine feminine is compassionate yet powerful. You know, it is both smart and also intuitive. You know, there's so much depth to it. When I think about what you just said, I think about Greta. And mm. I think about this child chose this life to have a bold cause to then now be threatened, her life threatened, her family's life threatened because she so believes in what you just said. Mm. Right? There's a Greta in all of us. And I, I want to encourage people to not just read your book, but imagine them changing something in their day. Just one thing in your day. If, if you all can change one thing in your day after reading this book, and by the way, when you read this book, it is going to be so easy for you to do because I already changed like three things in my day. And I got to go <laughs> back to the book because there's I got to read it one of the sections again. Wow. Uh, but this wow. is more than a pilgrimage. What you're helping us understand is this blueprint for understanding and to pick something from what you've shared in your own life's journey that will allow us to change something that innately is wanting to be changed in all of us. And I need to thank you for that. Thank you very much. It was so beautiful what you just said. Yeah, I want to thank you for that. You know, mm. I... I can't imagine, but I'm going to ask you this. What's next for you? Are you going to start to take people on the pilgrimage? Like what's next? <laughs> I, I'm working that out. You know, I, um, Hurry I, up. I also, <laughs> well, you know, I, I also write a guidebook on the, the, the Camino de Santiago that comes out yes. of, um, 
moon moon guidebooks from Berkeley and hatchet oh, books. Nice. And so I'll, I'll continue returning to update the guidebook. And I, I fold in a lot of folklore and history and archaeology and, and stories in, in, in what is also a practical guidebook. So and I was just I just came back from the Camino and from southwestern France. And part of the work is that part of it is I'm I'm, I'm starting to feel out, you know, what is the next project? Um, and it's probably going to dive even more deeply into the folklore of these areas yeah. that are really starting to come to the surface and speak very, very uh, much to our times. So it's really interesting to see the ancient and the modern connect. Uh, so, but I, the other, the other answer is, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm exploring right now. I'm That's back out on the trail. The yeah. That's actually why I asked you the question, because I think that what I want people to do is have a way to follow you and have a way to get the book. Because I do know that when you venture on what you ventured on and you, you, you write so beautifully about it, your life is forever changed. And trust me, when I came off of my first and second, my first vision quest, mostly my entire life changed. Yes. Everything. What I thought I was going to be changed. Thank you for today. Please give out your website again. Tell folks how they can get the book. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. It's been such an honor and pleasure to speak with you. Um, how do here. people get the book? It's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. Um, Google my name. My website will come up at the top. Uh, but it is bbbahrami.weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y.com. And or... Google the title of the book in the yeah. same thing. You'll find it all there. Yes. Very easy for everybody to remember the way of the wild goose. Just go ahead and Google that. And B-B-B-E-E-B-E. -B 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 -E -E -B -E. That's the way my sister used to spell her name. So just go ahead and you'll see. And if you do nothing else, go over, take a look at it, and take a look at, just take a look at the table of contents. I guarantee you, once you look at just the table of contents, you will want to know more. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Dr. Beebe, for everything you're doing. And yes, we will be waiting to see what you do next. But I do understand the process. You know, Thank you so much, Dr. Pat. Yep. Sometimes <laughs> after you venture and you get yourself on a pilgrimage, you just have to be. You yeah. just have to be. Uh, thank you, Dr. Beebe. Thank you, Michael. We're going to take a short break, everybody. Benny, we'll be right back. Give us a few minutes. Thank you. All clear. Thank 